The evidence in this case shows that the defendant, and only the defendant, murdered Molly Tibbetts. All of the credible evidence in this case, all of it, that there weren't two other guys. That's a figment of his imagination. All of the credible evidence in this case, all of it points at him. All of it. Closing arguments today, as you can see by that uh, jury clock, we three hours, 15 minutes, 57 seconds, no verdict, jury went home. But a lot of people think, well, why didn't they reach a verdict? Relax. This trial took six, seven days. So according to the Politan theorem, how long should deliberations take in a normal case? You're looking at six to seven hours, maybe just over a day. So maybe after lunch tomorrow, uh, that would be probably uh, the most likely time if this is a normal deliberation. If they start going past tomorrow, then you can start thinking about it taking a little bit of, long, of a long time and maybe uh, they're caught up on some stuff. Uh, let's bring back in Court TV legal correspondent Julie uh, Chanley Painter. It's Chanley twice. Double shot of Chanley tonight. Um, so the charges that they have to consider here, how many are there? How complicated uh, were the instructions here for this jury? Yeah, it may take them a while to just read through the jury instructions because not only are they considering the top count of what Bahina Rivera is charged with, that's first degree premeditated murder, but three lesser included. So let's take a look at what this jury may have been spending some time on this afternoon while working back there in the deliberation room. First, that first degree murder count, that's the willfully, deliberately, and with premeditation kills another person. That's a class A felony, mandatory sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole. That is what prosecutors are hoping for here, but the jury can also consider second degree murder. This is when a person commits murder that is not in the first degree. So not a plan or premeditation, and this is not a specific intent crime. So if they believe he blacked out, this may be where they're going here, Vinny. It's a class B felony. Punishment will be not more than 50 years in prison. Also, they can consider manslaughter, both voluntary and involuntary manslaughter here in the state of Iowa. And we know that voluntary manslaughter is causing the death of another person under circumstances that would otherwise be murder if the person acts with some sort of sudden, violent, and irresistible passion resulting from serious provocation sufficient to excite such passion in a person. Class C felony, 10 years in prison, and again, maybe he got so angry, they want to believe that that inflamed him to commit murder here, but also they can consider involuntary manslaughter as a lesser included, and that is when a person unintentionally causes the death of another person by the commission of a public offense or by a forcible felony, or by, it's by offense or by an act. So the second one is causes the death of another person by commission of a certain act in a manner likely to cause the death. Again, that's a class C felony and that's up to five years and some other uh, sentences can be for that. Well, unlikely they would get there given the facts that we have in this case, but, but hey, uh, who knows what a jury is doing back there, right, Vinny? No, exactly. You, you never know. Trust me, I've lived through it many, many times. Um, so. And you make a great point here, Chanley, because it's not just going back in that jury room and saying, guilty, not guilty. No, it, it could be not guilty, obviously, but it could be guilty, but guilty of what? And there can be holdouts for that. There can be discussions. You can go through all the evidence. Um, there was a, a, a jury once uh, in a case I was covering that got in there, and they took a week to go through the evidence before they ever even took a vote. And they took the first vote, and they all voted guilty. I was like, you could have done that five days ago, but that's not the way that jury did it. They wanted to go through the evidence and consider all of it. So um, let's, let's show some of the uh, closing arguments for folks who may not have seen them today. Uh, here's Scott Brown, Assistant Iowa Attorney General uh, for the state. The defendant, whenever they talk to him, they say, take us to her, and he does. Turn by turn. Takes him right there. Right, he led them to Molly in the dark from Yerby Farms. Remember when they left the police station, left the sheriff's office, they had to go out to uh, Yerby Farms to orient him, and then he took them there. No mention of two other men. Only Molly's killer would know her location. Only 
that person. And the defendant's uh, testimony proves how important this is. You know why? He knows this. He knows this is the one kind of thing that people can't get past whenever it comes to his guilt. Right? That he led them to the body. Wow, that's pretty powerful. So then what does he do? He comes up with another story. And most cases have that one big piece of evidence, right? This is the one big piece of evidence because when we think about the story of what happened to Molly Tibbetts, she was missing. Everyone was looking for her. It was the, the biggest search in the history of the state of Iowa for a missing person. And he took them right there. And, and, and from my perspective, for the jury, this is a guilty, not guilty issue, right? Whichever way you come down on this, on this issue, on why, on how he led them to the body, um, if you believe he knew it because he was the one that put her there by himself, then he's guilty of something. But if you believe or are considering his story, that's the road to not guilty. Yeah, and Vinny, I think the prosecutor did a good job of saying, look, he's been incarcerated for a couple of years now, and we're supposed to hand him all of our evidence. He knows all the evidence we have, where the DNA is found, you know, the, what his confession says. He had time to craft a story that made sense around the evidence we would present in this case. I thought that was a good way to spin, to get the jury thinking, okay, well, if he knew these facts, then it would be kind of craft the story because parts of this story maybe may have resonated with some of these jurors, right, Vinny? So I thought that was a good way to turn it back on the defendant here. Yeah, and I'll, I'll tell you what, I mean, there are different responses to his story. I, I mean, some people I've seen say, yeah, well, yeah, the defense has really, you know, given us something to think about here. And, and a lot of people are dismissing it as utterly ridiculous. But it's 12 people all have to agree to something. And that may be a part of the challenge here. Um, another one of the challenges was, why would he do it? Because this is not a career criminal. This is not someone who had a history of stalking women like that farmer. Um, take a listen to Scott Brown talk about the motive. How does the defendant have a motive? Well, he tells us what it is. Anger's a pretty good one. Anger is probably one of the oldest motives in the history of human beings for why people get hurt. Somebody gets angry and they take steps uh, and act on that anger. Why is he angry? She has uh, rebuked him. Molly threatened to call the police. We've already talked about this. We'll talk about it again because this does not fit at all with the other two men theory. So Molly rebukes him. Molly is uh, threatening to call the police and the defendant was angry. He says that. He tells us that. He also says when he gets angry, he blacks out. That's what he claims. That's what he told the police. But what do we know? We know that she rebuked him. He did not like it. And he is angry. And the way he reacts to that anger is to stab this young woman to death and dump her body into a cornfield. Now, I can understand um, this story as well, you know, because it, it came from him, right? This is what he told police, that... Um, he was, he's driving by, she's jogging, and she smiles and waves, right? She smiles and waves at him. He's reading that like, oh, my goodness, she likes me. So he, he goes and, and turns into the, the, the stalker, driving her, trying to find her, and, and approaches her. And then she freaks out because this guy has followed her in the car, has now gotten out of the car, is approaching her and doing whatever. She's threatening to call the police. He doesn't want the police involved because he knows he's in the country illegally, number one. And, and number two, he doesn't want to get arrested, and he's probably pretty angry um, that this, this, this woman has, has dared to turn him down and his fancy haircut. <laughs> that he still has after being incarcerated so long, by the way. But, yeah, is that the sudden provocation? 
that maybe inflamed him, invoked him to uh, commit murder here, that he would be so angry at being refused by Molly Tibbetts. Um, maybe that's where the jury would go here. Who knows about that? But another motive that, that the prosecutor pointed to, Vinny, on rebuttal was the sexual motive. I know you and I have talked about this previously after the medical examiner's testimony, and I was able to see those graphic photos, and there's no doubt. No person with any common sense can look at that and see that whoever killed her had a sexual motivation here. And the prosecutor arguing today that that corroborates his story that, oh, she, he thought she was hot and that was why he decided to stalk her, abduct her, and kill her. Chanley Painter on Verdict Watch and Breaking News tonight. Chanley, thank you so much. And thanks, Vinny.